InnerQuest explores various pathways through which you can connect with the infinite wisdom of the universe and apply it to personal, professional, and spiritual growth. This program, featuring accomplished practitioners, educators, and authors, is provided by Infinity Foundation, an innovative center for holistic studies and research. We invite you to share this journey with us. Hello, welcome to InterQuest. My name is Jay Stone, your host for today, and our guest is Dr. Doug Stewart. Welcome, Dr. Stewart. Thank you. Is it okay if I call you Doug? Please do. Okay. Doug is a global leadership consultant, interculturalist, and he's going to define interculturalist for us later, and a developmental coach who has worked in six countries on five continents. While his work focuses on adult uh, development, assessment, and transcending cultural boundaries, he speaks, writes, and sings about global transformation and the rising uh, human spirit. And we've got this instrument. You're going to explain what it is later. And okay. a little bit later, we're going to talk about uh, the CD uh, that you brought with you. But first, Doug, why don't you tell our audience the countries you've worked in and what you've learned from your experiences from these different countries? Well, okay. <clears throat> Well, I first worked in Germany, courtesy of the United States military, yeah. and uh, that turned out to be a fascinating experience. And, and was this during the Vietnam War? Yeah, era? it was, and I was just fortunate that uh, I got to go to Europe and uh, not not any further. And not any further. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and so that was a fascinating experience for me. And the German culture and the American culture have some similarities, and so it was a very positive experience. And I came home from that, went back to graduate school. And coming out of uh, a Ph.D. program, a friend of mine was a consultant. What, what, did, you st what did you study? Uh, I, well, I studied anthropology and linguistics. So mm -hmm. basically language systems and history of the English language and uh, English dialects. What, what school did you go to? Uh, Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. Uh, IIT, yeah. very good school. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I left that for Algeria. I, I had intended to go into college teaching, and a friend of mine was a consultant with an energy company, and they were working overseas, and he said, we need someone to set up an English language program for these, a uh, technical language program, you know, for these people in Algeria. So I went, never having been to Africa before, of course. And it was a, it was a powerful experience, being in a, development, a developmental country, you know, and uh, in an Arab and Muslim country. And how, how long were you in Algeria? Uh, two, year, little, two years and a little more. And uh, I came home from that, a uh, rather a changed person and an angry person because I saw the United States from a developing world perspective and I was suddenly very upset. And well, what, what, did, what was that perspective like? What were you seeing? Uh, well, what, was, what I was seeing is that there was a great deal of anger and jealousy about the United States. and. and that we are kind of ignorant uh, and not and don't understand the developing world and that we were stomping around the world with our power and money and, and, and it didn't uh, respect the cultures or the cultural differences uh, well that was no problem I mean we uh, the problem was for us there were teaching groups from six different countries there so we all had to learn to operate within the North African framework in terms of how we dealt with our students and, and the fact that in the Arab culture people share everything. So if I'm a good student in language and you have to write an essay, I write it for you. And then mm -hmm. when it's a mathematics test and you're good in mathematics, you write it for me and the rest of the students. And that became a very interesting challenge in a, a westernized school setting, you know, where... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was actually my first insight into how different a worldview can be and what, what is right and wrong and how that can change according to what your beliefs are of, of what you owe to other people. Mm -hmm. And it was a profound experience for me to see that there was a great moral rightness to this other way of teaching and learning. And yet we were proclaiming the moral rightness of our own, that we each have to learn all of these things separately. Have, have you been back to Africa since then? Uh, yes, I ended up some years later teaching a while in Egypt, mm -hmm. in, in Cairo, actually, to a group of petroleum engineers. And it was actually quite a different experience because Egypt was 
more used to foreigners and more um, developed culturally in the ways that we're used to. I mean, a big Cairo, you know, is a major city. So, but it, it continued to be fascinating in seeing how, from that part of the world, how people look at the United States. And, and coming from a country that I was very proud to be part of, I suddenly had to see that many people in the world have a different attitude toward us. And, and I would think that the perception has gotten more negative from Over when you years. first yeah, went yeah. to Africa. And is yes, but you know, I haven't done a lot of travel in the last few years, and I suspect it's just as well. <laughs> because yeah. the attitude has gotten much worse. Yeah, um, and so <clears throat> you, you, the work that you're doing, is, are you trying to bridge this gap? Well, I, I originally went there, of course, to teach English as a second language. The, most of my sojourns to other parts of the world were for those purposes. So uh, I wasn't thinking of it so much from bridging the cultural gap. But of course, I had to learn to do that as a teacher uh, and to help the students look at other cultures in a different way. And when I, I uh, returned from my, mo my last trip, which, which was to Vietnam, I worked in, in Hanoi. Uh, with professors from the uh, economics university who were learning English and, and a different kind of economics. Uh, and there I expected to be uh, hated because of the war. Uh, this was in the early 90s though. And in fact, there was no animosity. And people would say to me, you guys need to get over this. We've had two wars since you left. You have mm. to get on with your life now. You, you think that comes from their Buddhist teachings and perspective? I think, yes, I do. But I th and, and that was so deep there. Many of the students would take us on the weekends out to various temples and monasteries. And it's, it's very real that the, their integration with Buddhism is very different from, let's say, how we behave here going to church once a week. Mm -hmm. For them, when you're going shopping, you might stop by the temple and light a piece of some incense because you've got a sick relative or one of your kids is taking an exam and you need a little help from the ancestors. Mm -hmm. So it's just integrated into your daily life, your Buddhism. You put out something in the morning, uh, a little food, some fruit and something for the ancestors, and it's simply part of your life. Have you, de have, have you uh, performed any of the rituals since you've come back to the United States that you picked up in other cultures and countries? No, I didn't really pick up practices. I just, I think I picked up attitudes that have certainly been important for me. The, the, an openness to difference and mm -hmm. an appreciation that out of each culture you find ways of appreciating the world that you didn't find in your own. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's more um, about my inner self than about practices. Okay, but that interest has stayed with me, and I and I fell at really accidentally from that kind of work into becoming this interculturalist. And is that is that what you doing today, interculturalist? I am, but for for fifteen years I was the director of a group in a small company, that a director of the training group and selecting trainers and training trainers and uh, all the businesses with global businesses who move people around the world for business purposes. Mm -hmm. And so there's a standard practice, usually, uh, pretty standard, of helping people understand where they're going to get an insight into that culture and how it's different from our own and how they might consider their behaving there in order to get their needs met and get their job done. Well, it, it's interesting. I'll bring just a little bit of politics about the ambassadors. Some of the choices for ambassadors re lately have been criticized because they haven't even visited the country <laughs> yeah. that they're going to be an ambassador <laughs> to. Yeah. You so know. <laughs> so you, you, you would be helping people segue. Did you ever work with people with the Foreign Service? Or? No, I didn't, although I have friends who worked in the Foreign Service. And, and we make a kind of joke about it, that the, thing, the, the last thing you want in foreign, in, in the, at the ambassador level is people really understanding the culture they're in, because it's most important for them to represent the American government perspective in a foreign country. And they don't want them getting too close yeah. and being influenced in their attitudes, beliefs, behaviors by the locals. And so, of course you say that facetiously. <laughs> no, I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> the Foreign Service is different. Parts of the Foreign Service do have to have a deep knowledge of the culture. But at the top, the ambassador level is a political appointment and, and it's not. Some do, but very, you don't choose people necessarily because of that. Okay. 
And how has your work around the world, around the world influenced you and what you are doing today? Well, it's been a profound interest because, I mean, a profound effect on me because what, what I live for today and what uh, my wife and I work on is basically raising human consciousness. And the thing that has to happen in the 21st century if the human race is to survive it is that we collaborate much more closely around the world. So this intercultural competence is really about helping people from different places learn to understand each other and collaborate with each other. Uh, and, and that is becoming crucial for us. So the, the work of the interculturalist is basically that. You know, if, if you're on your way to China, my job is to help you understand the Chinese, how they're different from us, in what ways, and uh, how you might think about behaving with the Chinese in order to do whatever it is that you're going there for. Mm -hmm. And of course, this work is happening around the world, especially, uh, I would say, global business, which has a lot to be embarrassed about in some ways. On the other hand, is the biggest change agent in the world today in terms of creating this kind of collaboration. Well, it, it probably, global business has probably been a great change agent for the last 30, 40 years. Yeah. You know, I remember when I was in graduate school getting my MBA in the 80s, um, how they, you know, told us to think globally, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just driven home practically in every class, you know, and then, of course, one of the offsets of that was that, pe you know, people that went into, students that went into business then thought, well, it's cheaper to make things overseas than it is in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's been, that was very interesting, you know. It hasn't been that successful, but it's done a great job of developing countries all around the world because it's very expensive and you have to go in there and train people and hire people and build things and teach them how to do things. And then it gets too expensive to be there, so you go to the next developing country and do the same thing. So essentially, not by intention, yeah. we've produced tremendous developmental progress in many countries. Yeah, uh, and so the, the, the <coughs> developmental Progress is one thing, but what's the downside to that? Well, is there a downside I, to that? Well, the, the downside is that if you're the big powerful country in another place, you can do a lot of things that you probably shouldn't do. So the possible downside is taking advantage of being in another place. Exploitation. Of, of some kind of exploitation. But I think, it, at least in, mo in many industries today, there's less of that. There's the need, you see, to hire locally. And so then you have to train the local people, so it becomes and, and an is investment. That what, is that what you used to do? Did you train local people to, uh, to I know you worked with Americans going to other countries. Yeah. What about training people in other countries to communicate better uh, with Americans? Uh, no, I haven't done much of that work. I had a little of that in the UK and in Germany years ago, but mostly that's done by people like me who are Already there, there. yeah, okay. Right. And they're helping them understand the Americans and we're on this side. All right. Well, let's let's talk about your musical instrument. Okay. Um, and also, you're wearing something on your hands. <laughs> Is there a name for that? Is that a? Pick? These are finger picks. Okay. Right? And I have one on each finger. Yeah. Okay. And it, ex just explain the musical instrument. All right. So this is usually called an auto harp. Technically, it's a corded zither because when I press this, it dampens a lot of strings and just leaves one chord open. And so, there's a lot of dampers there. Yep. Was there <laughs> yeah. There's 5, 10, 14 there? Yeah, there's 37 strings here. This auto harp only plays in two keys, actually. Um, and I have four more at home to play in other keys. <laughs> okay. And, and it, uh, is there something on the side there? Is that just No, that's it? just a rest that uh, if I want to, s to, to put my arm under to, okay. to hold it. And, and how, how long has that instrument been around, do you know? Actually, since the, uh, the end of the, of the 19th century, the, the tabletop instrument without these bars is called a zither, and mm -hmm. it was very popular in Northern Europe for hundreds of years. And uh, Europeans brought it to America, but it was hard to learn to play. And the story is that a guy with a lot of these to sell said, you know, we could make this a lot easier to learn to play. And they put these chord bars on. So that's why some people call it an idiot's zither, because mm. if I hold a chord bar down, there are no bad notes. Okay. <laughs> have you, have so, you ever played a zither? 
No, I have a zither. My mother had a zither. She, she, her, her, her parents were German, and mm -hmm. uh, she, they had a zither. She passed it on to me, but I never learned to play it. Well, and, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to hold up this uh, um, CD now. Uh, what's on this CD here? Well, this is a project that uh, my wife, Bobby, and I put together uh, about 10 years ago, actually. Uh, we wanted to create some music for people who, who are children and people who have been children. And, and, <laughs> and, and this is the Parent Choice Award? And it won a Parent's Choice Award the, the year it well, Congratulations. Yeah, that we, it, so it's all original music, and my wife did the illustrations. She's yeah, the illustrations, beautiful. Uh, I'm going to hold up um, on the inside, too. There's some beautiful illustrations. Got to give your wife, my cousin, a little plug here, <laughs> who I'm going to get to interview in a few months. So that's the whistling yeah. pig. Yeah. And uh, basically it started around a story I, I was writing and uh, I wrote songs for the characters. And we still haven't published the story, although Bobby has done some beautiful illustrations. But we intend to, to revive this project now, produce the story, and have the music go along with it. Okay. And now uh, you're going to do a song for us. Uh, uh, it's about the interculturalists? Is that the song well, you want to do? Or you uh, want to do a different one? A different one. A actually, uh, at the basis of all my music is really opening the heart and joining together with other people. So interculturalism is a chance to do that in a professional way. But the music is a chance to help people do that in a, in a less formal way. So I wouldn't say it's written for intercultural. It's, uh, the music is written for anybody. Mm -hmm. to uh, encourage them. So I'm going to put the, I'm going to strap this to myself here. Are you going to stand up as well? And I'll stand up. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, there we go. You're watching Interquest and you're about to hear a performance by Dr. Doug Stewart. So if you're out there in the audience, this is usually a sing-along. Did I drop my... Uh... Yes, you did. Okay. W would you like me to hold it for you? Uh, you want it? Okay. All right. <laughs> well, maybe I'll sit down then so that you don't have to... Uh, I so. can stand up too, Doug. <laughs> you want to stand up? Let's All stand right, up. Yeah. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> well, I'll just sing it, and you'll see what happens here. Well, I never know exactly what this song is all about. It changes every time that I sing it. And if you'll sing with me, we can make this song our own. And let it be whatever song it is. Let it be whatever song it is Now it may not be a song You'll ever hear on radio And it may not make you laugh Or make you cry But la 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 with me And it will surely make you smile And smiling lets the love Into our hungry hearts And singing makes the love go all around Now we're going to sing the chorus Which only has one word La. La? Okay. You sing along if you'd okay. like. La 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 it may not make us laugh or make us cry But la 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 with me and it will surely make us smile And smiling lets the love into our hungry hearts And seeing makes the love flow all around So we la 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 one more time La 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 Yay. <laughs> Thank you.
You have a seat. Now, did you write the uh, lyrics, lyrics for the for that song? Yeah. Did you write the lyrics for? For all the songs. Yeah. But actually, that one was an easy one because that chorus <clears throat> just had one word. La. <laughs> And is there a particular reason why you uh, have the whistling pig? Boy, that's a deep philosophical question. Yeah? <clears throat> no. <laughs> well, we, yeah. originally when I saw the cover, I go, oh, now I, now, I know, now I have an image for when pigs fly. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, originally, uh, Bobby, my wife, was making some bath puppets for children. And, and one of them was a pig. And I said, I could write a song for that. Uh -huh. So I wrote The Whistling Pig, and then The Whistling Pig became the character in these stories, that he's a bard, he's a songwriter, he travels around and sings his songs and makes people happy. Oh, okay. So he, he has this... Uh, kind of like what you're doing. <laughs> well, yeah, kind of like me. <laughs> uh, now, can you tell our audience uh, a little bit about global leadership? Well, yes, you know, that's a huge topic today. Um, in, the, in the business world, in the world of churches, in the military, in education, that everybody is having to consider the globe in the work that they do today. And leadership is sadly lacking in all the organizations. And the challenge for the 21st century is how do we grow people to be capable of leading groups in the challenges that we face, the unprecedented challenges of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So there's a big focus on this in the business community uh, where they can actually pay to do the development if someone can figure out how it is that we help people become deeper, more spiritual, more connected. Uh, and so there's a lot of research going on and there's a lot of coaching going on of people who suddenly, for instance, get an international assignment. They've worked all their life in the United States, let's say, and suddenly they're going to spend three to five years in Thailand, mm -hmm. where the culture is entirely different, and they're going to be leading groups from Thailand and many other countries. How do we do this today? So it basically, uh, leadership is an emergent phenomenon. It comes out of us from becoming larger people, from having a higher consciousness. Uh, the work on human development coming out of the uh, Graduate School of Education at Harvard has shown models for human development, uh, which, may, which have this implication is that I can't teach you to be a leader, but I can help you grow in ways that allow you to lead differently. Well, uh, can you think of some great global leaders? Well, you know that... That From what perspective do we want to view the leadership? Well, you could, you could, you could pick the perspective. If I uh, pick the perspective. And, and this way people, you know, have mm -hmm. a model, mm -hmm. you know, that they can emulate or have some, some yeah, behaviors yeah. that they well, can then, shoot for. Then the people that come to my mind around this are, are Gandhi, mm -hmm. uh, Martin, Martin Luther, Luther King, King yeah. right, uh, Nelson Nine Mandela. Months. Yes. The people who rise far above the local challenge to deal with people from a very high perspective. Well, and, and I think you chose, the, the first two you chose are, are great because Gandhi used nonviolence and Reverend Martin Luther King saw and heard what Gandhi was able to con uh, accomplish with nonviolence and, and he did it as well. Right. So, you know, we don't know how to produce people like that but it is an aim around the world to figure out how to help people grow into this kind of perspective. Well, it, and it's interesting because, you know, it was like with all three of the people you chose, there was a need and, and, and they filled it, you know, right. and, and it's like in business. Abraham Lincoln would be an example from our own right. country. Right. You know, they just had a vision and they were able to carry that vision out <clears throat> into the world. Yeah. So but I, these are some extraordinary, you know, <laughs> some of the greatest humans that ever walked the face of the earth. Right. And we're going to need more of those if we're going to survive. A, a, a lot more. I would, yeah. I would agree. And I feel that that's happening. I mean, not that we're ra raising those kind of people, but I mean that the general level of human consciousness is rising. And the capabilities to be 
leaders in a larger perspective is slowly arising. I mean, we tend not to see that because we're looking at the disasters that are happening as we have an old system collapsing. Yes. But a new system is arising from the ashes of this, and those kinds of people are going to take us forward. Well, and, and what I see you and your wife, Bobby, trying to do is get people when they're young. So they, <laughs> yeah. they, they have that view and, and drive and determination. Yeah. You know, we have about four minutes left. Would you like to do another song? Okay, yeah, I've got one more. And, and do you want to talk a little bit about this song before uh, okay. you get into it? Yeah, and you know, I was going to say the simple word for what we're talking about here is love. Mm -hmm. We're trying to create compassion in people, which is a heart-centered consciousness, right? And we don't talk about it as love in the business world. <laughs> yeah. It, but this it, is re really where we're going. Yeah. <laughs> So I think I'll try this from just sitting down and maybe... I could, I could just see uh, Rahm Emanuel loving the Chicago teachers <laughs> or, or Bruce Rauner if he becomes governor. Well, I, I hope we see that. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I, if I you're, say that... If you're a betting that, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, this song is called Tear Down the Wall. And it's about the idea that as children, we often have to build walls to protect ourselves. And then we spend the rest of our entire life trying to take the wall down. What do we find when we take the wall down? Love, compassion, openness. Authentic self. Authentic self, right? Yeah. So we spend a lot of time and energy on that, you know. And, and by, in the song, which is called Tear Down the Wall, we assume there's a maintenance man. There's this thing inside us that every time we try to take the wall down, it goes back up. And before you, we, we've got now two minutes left. I'm going to let you play us out. So you just, okay, and you, you just all right. keep, keep going and they'll, they'll, they'll fade, fade, fade away. <laughs> So tear down the wall. <clears throat> well, I, well, I don't know where. What's the first words of this? Yeah, I don't. I don't recall constructing it. I don't recall constructing it. I never paid the bill, but there it is, twixt thee and me, and it kind of makes me ill. Tear down the wall, see eye to eye. Tear down the wall. Well, I've tried to take the whole thing down, just make it disappear. The guy just puts it up again, that wall is his career. Tear down the wall, the bench cheek to cheek. Tear down that wall, the bench cheek to cheek. Well, I've put ladders up in the windows through a built in swinging doors and stairs. But nothing stops the maintenance man, he's on call for repairs. Tear down that wall, walk hand in hand. Tear down the wall, walk hand in hand. Oh, the maintenance man is out of date, nobody needs a wall. And a bridge would be the thing to build if you've got to build at all. Tear down the wall, stand toe to toe. Tear down that wall, stand toe to toe. Say, would you help me with this job? With one on either side, we'll tear it down and haul it away and cross the great divide. Tear down the wall, talk heart to heart. Tear down that wall, talk heart to heart. Oh, the maintenance man, he's out of date. Nobody needs a wall. And a bridge would be the thing to build if you have to build at all. Tear down the wall, just let it fall. at 847-831-8828.